ఫోటోస్ అన్న కనపడ ఫోటోస్ అయితే వస్తాయి కదా ఫోటోస్ ఫోటోస్ వస్తాయి ఫోటోస్ కూడా రావా ఫోటోస్ వస్తాయి సార్ ఇమేజెస్ సార్ వీడియో నాకు తెలిసి అతని చెప్పు ప్రాప్ట్ ఉంటుంది సార్ అది అంటే ఇప్పుడు ఆ వీడియోని మనం ప్లే చేసుకోవాలి
Good afternoon, everyone, and warm greetings on behalf of Indian Academy of Pediatrics, the Twin Cities branch, and welcome you all to the first uh, physical clinical meeting of this year. And it's very nice to see you all in person. We have seen each other on screens, on small mobile phones, on laptops. And for once, it feels very good that there are more people around us and we are not alone. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming along. And uh, we hope to have more physical meetings now that the COVID wave is lesser. We are all vaccinated and protected as well. IEP Twin Cities branch is committed to take forward the president's vision of ensuring academics and uh, advocacy for child health, along with uh, very interesting programs on uh, breastfeeding and also creating new chapters, ensuring that the IAP brotherhood spreads. And uh, we request all of you to be a part of this journey for us, along with us for this year. And uh, thank you all for your kind participation in all the activities, the online activities so far, and request your support for the year ahead as well. May I now request, uh, before I ask the host to take over, may I now request the President IIP Twin Cities branch, Dr. Bhaskar sir, for his remarks. And then we'll have a small event where we are releasing, a, making an announcement of a very major conference. Bhaskar sir, for your remarks, please. Esteemed experts, Dr. Namit Yeshmo, Dr. Chen Chen, distinguished guides, Dr. Preeti Nagaras, Dr. Sima Spooky, Dr. Balaji, and Dr. Anupama, dear colleagues, presenters, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all for this uh, third IEPTCB clinical meeting. And the second one, which we are doing in person. The first one we did in Nilofar in the month of January. There was huge attendance because it was in Nilofar. There were more than 98 participants and most of them were postgraduates. At the outset, I'm thankful to Ankura for various reasons. One is, for hosting this uh, third IAPTC weekly meet. And earlier, for our, most of our academic activities, 
encouraged to participate very actively. Just to cite an example, our second symposium was on IAP pulmonology, wherein Dr. Suman and Dr. Sinwar Chakra, uh, they played a, played a crucial role. They were the uh, guest speakers and as well, they participated in the panel discussion. Not only that, in our uh, last annual conference of uh, Twin Cities branch with Telangana State, one of the huge contributors in terms of financial assistance was none other than Ankur Hospital. So, so much regards we have for Ankur Hospital on behalf of IAPTCB. And I'm sure uh, earlier, now and in future, this relationship will uh, continue. Unfortunately, we are getting very good response for uh, most of our IAPTCB clinical meetings. Even for this meeting, we had to request a uh, few other presenters to participate in the next month. So that is the response we are getting from many of our uh, pediatric institutes. And uh, secondly, here I request you to, so many academicians are there in Ankura and as well in other institutes, I request you to actively uh, be along with the general committee to contribute to any interesting cases, any clinical news in brief, or any important uh, articles from the journals of uh, uh, pediatrics. First time in public, we are announcing that uh, IAP Twin Cities branch in association with uh, Telangana State, we are organizing IAP Central Zone Midterm Conference on 10th, 11th, and 12th. The Central Zone comprises of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, and Chhattisgarh. It's a vast area. So it's almost a mini national conference. And wherein our representation is going to be in large number academically and in attendance wise. Lastly, I invite you all to the third pediatric symposium on this coming Sunday, that is sixth of this month. It's exclusively on exclusively on pediatric subspecialty nephrology, even there exclusively on urinary tract infections, UTI. All the four guest lectures will be on UTI, completely covering A to Z comprehensively, followed by a 45 minutes of a panel discussion wherein the moderator will be covering other topics of pediatric nephrology other than UTI. So with this a few remarks, I once again thank you all for coming in a big number. This gives us an encouragement to the presenters, to the experts, and to the organizers. So thank you once again. Thank you one and all. Thank you, Master, sir. I now uh invite uh, Ankura Hospital, the host for the event, uh, thank Dr. Krishna Prasad and uh, Dr. Durga Prasad for immediately accepting the request at a short notice. Unfortunately, they have another meeting, they have just left, so I request Dr. Namita to say a few words on behalf of the host and then we'll begin. Good afternoon all. I welcome you all on behalf of Team Ankura. Uh, it is a pleasure to host this meeting where there are participants in big numbers and good academic discussion is going to happen. Let us start the meeting uh, without wasting any further time. But before that, I will want to welcome Dr. Sankoj Bhaskar, President of IAP, with presenting a bouquet. Can I request Dr. Anil to present the bouquet to sir, please? Anil, sir, Uh, I welcome Dr. Shri Krishna, President of uh, IPTCP Chapter. Can Dr. Zaid come and present book to sir? <laughs> Thank 
let us start with the first I case. Just have, I just have two minutes. Sure, yeah. please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angra Hospital, for the kind of hospitality. Before we start, I just have one announcement on the IAP Central Zone Conference. As our president of the Baskar sir mentioned, it's a very prestigious conference and request you to participate in big numbers. We'll have a lot of academics and uh, Hyderabad is now touted to be the, the best center in the country to hold very good academic conferences. I now request uh, Baskar sir, our president, to please uh, come forward and uh, release the, the first flyer of the conference. Uh, could you please open the image or the folder so that sir can just click on it. Sir Baskar, sir, you will have to click on uh, open chase. This one. Yeah. Maybe it will open chase. I can just save. Video record. Click chase. Yes. Okay, let it be. That's it. I say privilege and honor for me to release this uh, first flyer in presence of uh, distinguished participants. Let us wish uh, this conference a grand success. It's possible with your support and cooperation. At this juncture, I would like to remind those who are not the members of IAP, please take membership. Otherwise, the delegate fee for the non iap members may be high, may be high for the people. Some person may not be, but it's high. So, and secondly, our IAP was so kind of, they're trying to have more members. Further, they're giving me a financial incentive, though that's not a big money, but it's a stimulation to have the membership. So we are giving 1,000 rupees as an incentive for those who take membership, particularly those who have a BCH or MD or DMB, for them, this facility there is there. First 50, we are going to offer it. So please come forward. Thereby, you will be saving 1,000 there, maybe another one or 2,000 here. So once again, I request you all to bring the members. Our uh, strength is around 1,600 members right now, despite the fact that there are more than 5,000 pediatricians in Twin Cities in GHMC limits. So there are so many people yet to join. So with these few remarks, I pray God for the success of this uh, Central Zone Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Baskar, sir. Now we start the academic session. I hand it over to Dr. Srikant, who will just introduce on behalf of IP Twin Cities branch. He's the coordinator for the event, and uh, he'll coordinate uh, with, uh, with, with the experts. Over to you, Dr. Srikant. Good afternoon, everyone. So, Shall I hand over the uh, proceedings to Dr. Amita? Probably uh, the first case I I would like to uh, invite Dr. Harshita from Ankur Hospital, <clears throat> and uh, she'll be guided by Dr. Balaji. I request Dr. Balaji to come forward and uh, take seat. So she'll be presenting a case of uh, a newborn with uh, persistent sinuses. Please come and take the rest. What? Yes, 
system. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, my topic is approach to a neonate with persistent cyanosis. So, a 27 day old female baby brought by her parents to outpatient clinic with chief complaints of decreased activity since two days and decreased intake of feeds since morning. So, in the history of present illness, baby was apparently asymptomatic two days back. Then, mother noticed that the baby is having irritable cry and decreased activity since two days and decreased intake of feed since morning. And further detailing about the history, mother told that there was a history of an, uh, episodes of sudden onset of bluish discoloration of the skin. And there was no history of vomiting or loose motions. There was no history of fever or decreased urine output. There was no history of any uh, audible, audible sounds. There was, there was no history of difficulty breathing. But in the past history, when we go into the detail, there was history of intermittent episodes of bluish discoloration of skin with excessive crying one week back and for which they have contacted, consulted in other hospitals where 2D echo was done and where they have checked the saturations where their SPO2 was around 60 to 70 and they have done the 2D echo twice and uh, 2D echo was normal and within one to two hours and the saturations were improved so uh, doctors told them that it is okay and it is normal for the age. So uh, that was a past history, which is important. And the other thing is there was history of bilateral CTEV since birth for which POP cast is in place. The birth history, antenatal history, primary mother, antenatal history is completely insignificant except polyhydramnios was present since third trimester onwards and baby was on thyronom 25 mcg for hypothyroidism and uh, baby was a term baby uh, with birth weight of 2.7 kg cried immediately after birth and delivered by elective lscs and there was no history of nicu stay and uh, baby's vital signs were uh, temperature was 98.4 and color was dusky. Respiratory rate was 30 per minute and shallow breathing was present. Pulse rate was 134 per minute, regular, normal in volume, no radio radial delay, no radio femoral delay. Pulses were well felt and saturations were around 69% in room air. Peripheries uh, in both lower limbs, the cast was in place. In the upper limbs, there was hypothermic and sinosis was present and CRT was less than three seconds. In anthropometry, weight at the admission is 3.5 kg. Length and head circumference both were normal for the age. Length is 51 centimeters and head circumference is 35 centimeters. Uh, on the examination, in the general examination, baby was irritable and intermittent dullness with peripheral cyanosis. And airway was patent and her breathing, were, breathing pattern was shallow and bread ipnic. Bilateral air entry is equal and saturations were fluctuating with the 69 to 75% in all four limbs in room air. In the circulation, heart rate was 175 per, 175 per minute. S1, S2 heard no, no pathological murmurs. Pulses were well felt in all four limbs. And BP was 62 by 36 um, with a map of 45. Uh, pupils were equal in size and reactive to light. Her abdomen soft and there was no organomegaly. In CNS examination, tone and reflexes were normal. So this is the baby. With uh, we could we, we could find the bluish discoloration over the lips. This is the video just before uh, the patient shown to outpatient. If, if we observe closely, we could find the apnea episodes and bluish discoloration of the lips. In summary, this baby is a 27 days old female baby, term gestation, born to a primary mother, 
with antenatal significant history of polyhydramnios and non consanguineous marriage birth weight of 2.7 kg presented to the outpatient with acute onset of decreased intake of feeds and decreased activity with recurrent episodes of cyanosis and excessive crying with pop cast for ctev bilateral ctev in c2 and systemic examination there was only positive findings were bradypneic and shallow breathing was present now it is open for the discussions thank you dr arpita for presenting the uh, uh, case so now uh, at this point of time uh, the case is open for discussion so uh, for audience if there any question the by history and the uh, clinical examination finding at admission uh, what all differentials uh, we have to keep in mind any any, any idea from uh, audience especially pp students any project any project from the system history of the maternal gd no there was no history of maternal gd the only significant history was polyhydramnios any project No, actually, uh, baby came to emergency room. There, I um, mean, baby was not fed, and the baby was having apneic spells. Baby was having dusky color, and there uh, we could not find any frothy secretions coming out of the mouth in the ER or in the outpatient clinic. And uh, immediately after birth, the baby was handed over to the mother. Baby was on breastfeeding for three weeks before they came to us. So there was no history of frothing baby. The antenatal perinatal course was completely uneventful. Baby was with the mother for the first three weeks. Then they noticed the sudden breast folding spell-like episode, which is which is with cyanosis. Then the baby going into apnea on the twenty-first day of life, and they came to us on the twenty-seventh day. Choking episode was there? No, no, sir. No, there was no choking episode. There was no choking episode. Baby was on exclusive breastfeeding. Was there a breathing episode? No, no, no history of vomiting also. No history of regurgitation. Any inputs about what could be the possible differential? And the saturations also improved with supplemental oxygen. So it was sixty-nine to seventy percent on room air, and as soon as we gave supplemental oxygen, the saturations picked up to ninety to ninety-five percent. बट the baby fed excessively on the breast no actually uh, the mother said the baby was feeding adequately with good urine output and she was also able to hear audible swallowing sounds and the frontal was normal there was no bulging there was no bulging the fees at level any retrocolic position Baby has been sensitive. No. Huh. Yeah. So, so baby had intermittent episodes of shallow breathing. Ah, uh, the three three was to fall down. When we observed in the emergency room, the parents came to us with cyanosis. But when we observed the baby, intermittently used to have uh, respirations of up to just twenty to twenty five per minute, which is not normal for a newborn. And then the baby used to become cyanos, and then the baby again used to pick up, and then continue normal breathing, and then again an episode of apnea. So these events were happening uh, multiple times in a period of twenty-four hours. So on the whole, otherwise normal baby, uh, only antenatal finding of polyhydramnios presented as with decreased intake of feeds, decreased activity with bilateral CTUV, and examination finding only. Uh, significant and positive was bradypneic and shallow breathing. There was no history of decreased fetal motor, and polyhydramnios was present in the seventh month. 
and there was no increase in AI price. It was 24. Three years span was also it was 24 and 25. There's no apparent increase in the AI price. This is the baby that is there. Like visual innovation, it seemed like the technology India. I'm not sure because they are like, uh, it, was, it was very mild. Right. Right. What was the mode of visual? LSES. LSES. Elective. Uh, elective LSES. It was elective LSES was CPD. 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 Developer right. with the board. So when we go forward, so we have the case of babies having uh, cyanotic spells. So the most common causes generally we could think of is first thing is the presentation is decreased feeding and decreased activity. So it could be and with uh, cyanotic episodes, it could be central nervous system depression for which we have to uh, work. We have to do workup or for meningitis or encephalitis are IVH. The other most common causes are any CCHD's presentation. And other presentations were IEM, any metabolic causes can be present in this way. Are other causes are any neuromuscular disorders. So in the emergency room, baby was started on supplemental oxygen by nasal prongs. Saturations improved to 92%. And initial blood gas on oxygen support was pH 7.07, PCO to 97, PAO to 80, and bicarb 28.1. Baby was shifted to NICU and kept on NIV with minimal settings. So initial investigations are like this. Septic profile, hemoglobin was 14.6 grams, PCB 44.1. CRP 1.26, WBC 14,300 cells, platelets 2 left, 15,000, and serum electrolyte sodium 135, potassium 4.3, and chloride 100. All septic profile parameters are normal. And further workup serum LFT, bilirubin is 6.3, direct fraction is 0 0.3, SZOT, SZPT are normal, ALP normal, total protein 5.6, serum albumin also 3. Even coagulation profile, PT, APTT, INR, all, all are in the normal range. So in the, this is the first X-ray of the baby. So before starting the NIV support on oxygen. So within starting of two hours of NIV, baby was, uh, the repeated ABG was PH 7.49 and PCO to 38 and PO to 209 and base X is 5.7. So, uh, in the NICU goes, baby was initial, uh, initially on the minimal settings of NIV. Even within 24 hours of uh, admission, baby, we could able to notice that there was persistent uh, apnea episodes with shallow respiratory efforts. And baby was uh, 27, 27 day old, baby was crying. So we intubated the baby and kept on ventilatory support. So we could observe the serial blood gases where we could find the first ABG with PCO2 of 97. And after NIV support, we were able to 38 and 41 with the repeated uh, apneas. Again, the, P, uh, the PCO2 increased to 115. And where we have planned for intubation and we kept on NIV support. So the other, other additional investigations, what we have done was neurosonogram, which was normal, and 2D echo was repeated, which was normal. And we have sent for TMS and urine GCMS. That report was awaited at that time. And uh, next serum ammonia was done, which was normal. And uh, with the help of uh, pediatric neurologist, uh, suspecting the, the main differential diagnosis for the hypoventilation. So we have planned for MRI, MRI brain, which was also normal. And baby was continued on ventilatory support. We were unable to extubate and repeated markers are also normal and blood culture reports were also normal. So then we have uh, taken the, retro we have done the retrospective analysis within the history. So mother, uh, there was antenatal history of polyhydramnias. And when we dig into the history, then mother was saying that there was excessive drooling and Baby was gulping the feeds, and I mean, at the end of the feeds, baby is taking two to three feeds, and baby started getting fatigue and sweating. And again, she has to give some time. Then again, she is take uh, baby is ready to take the feeds. 
So uh, fatigue at the end of the feeds with uh, forehead sweating and uh, there was a sucker is suck cycle. And even uh, one week back, they have noticed that, but the doctors gave assurance that it was normal for that age. So they have not observed that uh, within the week, all these apneic episodes and baby presented us with the PCO2 of 97. And there was persistent acral uh, cyanosis and shallow breathing efforts, which we could see in the video that was before, uh, uh, before admission. Okay, uh, so we, we, now we got to the conclusion that it is a hypoventilation cause. So then what could be the reason, whether it is a central cause or peripheral? Central, we could able to rule out with the help of uh, MRI, which is normal. Now we have to think about the peripheral. So first we'll come to the skeletal. There was no chest deformities. We could not see anything. For the neuropathies, for SMA, uh, DTRs are deep tendon reflexes are normal. For skeletal muscle, for, uh, for skeletal muscle, congenital myopathies also, there was no muscle, I mean, no, there was no hypotonia and the, uh, in the shape of the face or in any muscle weakness. And see, we have sent the CPKMB also, that was also normal. So suspecting the neuromuscular junction disorder, congenital myasthenia with the help of pediatric neurologist, Dr. Chaitanya. So, uh, the, uh, with the findings of normocephalic age appropriate muscle bulk, the, with that we can rule out the myopathies with symmetrical and equally expanding chest bilaterally with a normal tone and with TTRs eligible and no other contractures except no, no contractures with the investigations MRI and brain spine normal study CPK level 221, which was not significant for myopathies, we strongly suspecting of congenital myasthenia syndromes. And as per the uh, up-to-date uh, uh, up protocol, we have uh, given the trial of uh, pyridostigmine on fifth day of admission, seven mg per kg per day, and 3.5 mg every fourth hour with strict monitoring for vitals. Uh, we could not able to find, uh, there were no complications. But uh, with the pyridostigmine trial, within 40 hours, we should notice the improvement. We were, but the, the respiratory efforts were little bit improved, but there was still the uh, situation was same. We should, we were, I mean, we were not able to extubate. Then uh, we have supplemented with syrup solbutamol at 0.1 mg per kg, 8 hourly, and continued on the pyridostigmine therapy. Within 48 hours, baby was extubated to NIV support, and in next uh, 24 hours, shifted to nasal oxygen and gradually tapered off oxygen. So, and we have sent for the genetic testing, whole exome sequencing. And, uh, and after that, we have involved mother into the baby's care and we have started on the direct breastfeeding. And uh, we have discharged the baby with uh, educating the parents about the saturation and respiratory efforts monitoring and with uh, apnea monitor, we advised apnea monitor and stim uh, stimulator and continued on the pyridostigmine 3.5 mg and salbutamol 1 ml yaitali and following up with the pediatric neurologist. I think Dr. Chaitanya sir can enlighten us about this disease. Why the baby was put on the salvitamol? Yes, sir. So we have Dr. Chaitanya, a pediatric neurologist. Uh, he was uh, involved in the uh, management of this case. So uh, let us uh, see the comments from him. Any other questions? Medical treatment only. Three options are there. One is salvitamol. One is salvitamol. And in my senior uh, medical treatment options are only three options. One is fibrostigmine, one is salbutamol, and next is the And uh, so we, uh, based upon the history, actually, uh, I mean, my senior went bad. Come on to the bad <laughs> So you can see the uh, flow chart. So, so many times, so not only pyridostigmine and salbutamol and uh, other uh, epidrine, they have additive effect on those things because salvatorical mechanism is stabilizing the uh, synaptic receptors uh, uh, underlying network so that it will help in congenital myasthenia. So we have only three options. So we tried first pyridostigmine. After ruling that it is not responsive to pyridostigmine because the clinical features we ruled out. Uh, so that usually congenital myasthenia syndromes. 
usually congenital myasthenia syndrome. So we never tried phytosigmine till now because congenital myasthenia, may, so if you give phytosigmine, sometimes it will go down also because it is not like normal myasthenia which responds to phytosigmine. So, but meticulous clinical features, after doing that, it is not, uh, it is not against go with phytosigmine. So through this DOC7 and pol 9 mutations and the slow channel syndrome, then we safely started phytosigmine and we supplemented with salbutamol. So we get the IT effect with the salbutamol, then finally we got the response. How could it be established the patient of myasthenia because points in favor of congenital myasthenia? Yeah, definitely. So uh, usually, so mainly the symptoms are there. We have uh, second essay, kelp fatigability, and uh, since birth, some tooling is there, and also recently apneic episode. These are the symptoms of the uh, myasthenia. See, fatigability means only two things. That's three things. One is respiratory or cardiac and muscle. So if you rule out the respiratory and cardiac, then what is rest is muscle only. So, this approach. is approach. The patient is responding to the biosynthesis. So, then myasthenia. So, myasthenia, so what is the possibility at this age? First thing, it is congenital. Yeah, neonatal myasthenic virus. So, first to three hours, so three days of stay, there is no symptoms. And your mother also not myasthenia gravis. So, we ruled out uh, neonatal, neonatal myasthenia gravis. Then, we think about the congenital myasthenia. Then, we review the literature. Then, the symptoms is more prone towards the responsive to further treatment, then you start the trend. In this case, salbutamol not only dilates, it also helps in mucus clearance. So whatever the secretions are there, so the yeah. clearance also will be little enhanced. Okay. So that is that way it is helpful to the child. No, no. See, neurosis point of view, I can say that it is acting at the synaptic synapse receptors. So from a neural point of view, we can say that it is also acting like so, so as a neurologist, I go with mechanism mainly. Does this baby need to say nucleotic Why? So it doesn't need it. No. No. Not the same. Follow this with some bit of a light. If so, uh, how frequently this will matter still in the fluids? Yeah, we are uh, every, I think, uh, we are visiting every. Uh, Monthly, as I know, initially two weeks, then after month, every week they are collecting the pertinent report, production levels, production levels, and that's what they are writing. This is the confirmation. This is the confirmation. The response of five days to me. It's self confirmation. This is the confirmation. In case, suppose, sir, the case doesn't respond to five days to me. Then only genetics confirms. Then only genetics confirms. The closest DD lying here with the SMA. So, SMA is not frequent because all the fetus pertain to even SMA. If I have a fatigue and then ruling and aspiration, then reflexes normal. Reflexes normal. DDS or DDS. And also, DDS is normal. And also, we have done also NCB and NCB ruled out to SMA. Any fibrillation was there? No fibrillation. No fibrillation. Parents are screened. Parents, after we have sent the genetic screen, once they came, then we send the parent. And is there any antibodies that will that help you? No, no, that's what I expected. So we ruled out neonatal medicine because the first three hours are, uh, first three days, child is normal. First three weeks, in fact, normal. And also there is no symptoms on neonatal uh, medicine, mother, even myotonia, nothing is there. I asked everything. Sir, in general, in general, sir, how to assess the patient with myasthenia? No, no, this is different case. Uh -huh. In general, sir, in general, because we have gone through the all gamuts of the events huh. and we prove that it is a myasthenia. Huh. But in general, sir, so that's so usually, I got to change in our case, sir, except, except, uh, I mean to say, a clinic space that that too frequent. We have nothing, sir. That is why, that's why, everything. That's why this case is very important. We are telling it here. This is very important case. Uh, we are, uh, okay, for example, what is the scenario if we miss the diagnosis? Because we are thinking some other thing, some other thing. Finally, we will send the in home ventilation and trachea swimming. So that's why this case is very important. Usually, periodically, a juvenile myasthenic virus will be diagnosed by only three modes. One is clinical symptoms plus either endo, endo uh, uh, from EM, uh, test via pyridine treatment trial or NCV EMD differential pattern or ACTH antibodies. This is the this is the diagnosis. So it doesn't need any uh, confirmation else. So if the child responds, if the child responds to pyridose treatment or endophonium, that's confirmed the diagnosis. Because uh, mainly clinically, so child improved. So as per the symptoms correlating with the findings, 
test done that kind of the things. What could have been other diagnosis? In, suppose if it's no, no other diagnosis. One thing is there some rare conditions like uh, congenital myopathy with myasthenia component is there that can suspect that can be revealed in uh, only uh, genetics. Only. Congenital myopathy, for example, myotubular myopathy, it has myasthenia component. So, but but the, in the scenario, a child is healthy, muscle bulk is normal, complete everything, weight is normal. So there is no any contractures. So not, so that's why. Purely it is a congenital myasthenia as for the uh, entire thing. Was EMT done in this case? EMT was done, yeah. Simple fibrillations are there, and there is nothing we will see. Mainly, mainly NCV EMT role is nothing in uh, congenital myasthenia like in uh, juvenile thing. In this, why we use, uh, we've done uh, NCV is to roll out this slow channel syndrome. Slow channel DOC7 and POLQ because if you, if you, the child with a POLQ7 mutation, POLQ mutation, yeah, DOC7 mutation, a slow channel mutation, if you give punishment, children will deteriorate. So we take almost all precautions before starting by this event. That's why I'm telling, because my experience only three and a half years, four years, three years in BGA and one and a half uh, things, eight months in Hyderabad. So we never tried by this event in Hyderabad. Yeah. So first time, because of the uh, parents' concerns, then I strictly followed the symptomology. Then uh, after doing NCV, so everything we think that, yes, we had to give the try. Because already child has been incubated. So what, nothing else will happen except improvement. One more question is, sir. In this case, we are getting salbutamol. Hmm. Salbutamol does cause hypokalemia and causes muscle weakness. No, that's now what we are we monitoring. Are... That's why we are monitoring. Yes, sir. That's why we are monitoring. Simply. How long should we give the salbutamol? Yes. So usually, uh, the prognosis. Uh, yes. This app, main thing in congenital myasthenia. So what what myasthenia means? Weakness only. Apart from what is the danger thing in this is apneic episodes. So as per the long uh, cohort studies, so, the, so span, mainly Spanish studies are there. So apneic episodes happen up to two years of age. So we need to continue up to maximum two years of age. Then we can give the trial of tapering and stop the medications. Then we can see if the child doesn't develop any weakness, child will be free. Again, again, child develop the weakness, we need to restart. Then we have to monitor the hyperkalemia. I have a question, risk of MRI in this child basically did so many years. Uh, uh, Poor ventilation and uh, service studies, peripheral nerve studies, and all those things. What would be a better choice for you? And actually, my, my, my question yeah, is about what is the role of MRI in this child? Yes, yes. Actually, the thing is, uh, MRI as well as symptomology is peripheral cause. But the parents, they are more apprehensive that uh, at least scan cardo, at least scan cardo at the MRI. So we have these things also in practice. So not like in. Uh, that, that <laughs> so mainly. Mainly, and also we learned that, yeah, definitely we will get one day more time to think. With a child, you told their hypoventilation episodes, you know, MRI takes 30 minutes, you need a MRI competent pulse ox, you need it. You took the MRI with the long tube into the machine, how do you get the MRI? Mm -hmm. Just for my interest. So I didn't that with the intubation only. So because you understand, right? So, yeah, yeah, so the baby MRI kept on. Would have been this thing then the peripheral would have been more useful and more clinical approach would be more useful. Yes, baby you know, was on a ventilator only, then only we have done the MRI. My question is peripheral and clinical yes, so more appropriate. I think more of uh, parental pressure for yeah, MRI than is very high. <laughs> <laughs> Still is high. Oh. Uh, they are messaging every day. <laughs> when it comes to neurology, most of the parents do ask for uh, imaging. Such, such babies can have certain issues. Uh, uh, we will go for the next case and we can discuss uh, about the case in detail later. Uh, while we treat, uh, we have three more cases today. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is a great case. Uh, the next case is uh, a child with hypertension. I request now Dr. Aisha to come forward and uh, request Dr. Anupama and uh, Manik Dev also uh, to come and uh, Dr. Manik, please. Dr. Aisha. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Aisha, uh, President from Rainbow Genomes Hospital. Uh, my moderator is Dr. Anpama and Dr. Mahindra Dev, sir, and Dr. Saramya. Uh, I'm presenting, I'm here to present the case of a child with hypertension. So this is a 12-year-old male child, third by birth order, born out of non-consanguineous marriage, from Moinabad, bought by parents whose history is reliable, present in October by uh, 2021 to hospital with the complaints of vomitings for two days, the intermittent abdominal pain for two days, and decreased activity since one day. Apparently, it was all right three months ago, and then parents noticed the child to have polyuria, polydipsia, and significant weight loss, and generalized weakness, generalized weakness for three months. The present technician, he came with a history of vomiting for two days, two episodes per day. Is it not? Uh, non bilious non projectile in nature, and abdominal pain for two days, intermittent, generalized, dull aching, non radiating in nature, and excessive sleepiness, <coughs> responding to voice since one day prior to which uh, he was admitted in hospital and treated and referred for the management to the Rainbow Children's Hospital. So there was no history of fever, loose motions, cough, fast breathing, uh, no history of cranial nerve involvement. There was no history of cerebellar signs or trauma. There was no history of cough, low grade fever, night sweats, TB contact. There was no history of COVID illness. There was no history of travel. There was no history of hematuria, dysuria, or skin infections. There was no history of drug intake or any other medication history. There was no history of headaches, blurring of vision or seizures. The past and family history is not significant and birth history was uneventful. Developmentally, he is appropriate for age and is immunized till date. Nutritionally, he is taking a, is taking a diet consisting of family pot, which consists of cereals, pulses, uh, with no protein or calorie gap. Uh, socioeconomically, he belongs to low middle class as per the Kupi Swami classification. So coming to the summary, we have a 13-year-old male child presented with acute MSS, encephalopathy, with the background history of polyuria, polydipsia, weight loss, and generalized weakness for past three months. So the possibilities. So I think students should take this uh, question. What are the possibilities? Acute pain, abdomen, with background history of polyuria, polydipsia, and weight loss. What are the most likely diagnoses? I think we'll come to the investigation. She'll tell us about the blood results, what happened in the next. Anything more? This is basically the history. So coming to possibilities. So the differentials based upon the clinical history, the first one would be diabetic ketoacidosis with the history in favor would be polyuria, polydipsia and weight loss and not in favor would be, uh, there was no acidotic breathing. Uh, the second would be the diabetic insipidus uh, because there was besides polyuria, polydipsia, vomiting, there's also confusional state, but the age and presentation, the chronic history and polyuria is not a presenting complete here. And uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, weight loss is in favor and uh, polyuria uh, and uh, acidotic breathing and doesn't support the diagnosis. This could also be the CNS, uh, chronic infectious like TB or space occupying lesions. 
in favor would be weight loss and encephalopathy and doesn't support is there was no history of fever or clear enough involvement or there's no headache so moving ahead come to general examination child was in encephalopathy he was not oriented to time place and surroundings with e3 m5 and v4 the vital parameters he was a febrile and there was a blood pressure of 240 by 160 with a map of 180 mmhg in all the four limbs in supine position the heart rate was 122 it was regular in rhythm normal in volume and character and all the peripheral pulses were felt there was no radio radial or radio femoral delay it was maintaining saturations at room air with a respiratory rate of 24 there was no pallor ictus clubbing cyanosis edema or generalized lymphadenopathy seen anthropometry uh, his height and weight were coming on the 50th centile and he was smr of grade 2 Had to do examination. There was no facial dysmorphisms. There was two facial tags of 0.5 to 10 mm in size present on the right side of the face. There was no neurocutaneous markers seen. No otorrhea. No swellings uh, present on the body. And skull and spine were normal. Then coming to central nervous examination, his higher functions. He was not oriented to time, place, or surroundings. His speech was irrelevant. His comprehension was affected. Uh, his he was E3, M5, and V4. Clearing of examination, the fundus was fundus examination was normal, and other elliptical cranial nerves were normal. Motor examination normal, reflexes normal. Sensory system could not be elicited, and cerebellum was normal. There was no involuntary movements. There are no signs of raised ICP or meningeal signs. Cranium and spine normal, and other system examination was normal. the possibilities now we have an acute onset hypertensive emergency acute encephalopathy with a background history of polyuria polydipsia weight loss and generalized weakness so the examination close uh, on examination uh, there was no abdominal bruise so rules out renal artery stenosis there was no abdominal palpable uh, palpable abdominal mass rules out neuroblastoma or polycystic kidney disease there was uh, the upper limb and the lower limb bps were normal Corp rules out cooperation of aorta there was no exophthalmos tachycardia or palpitations rules out hyperthyroidism there was no palpitation sweating or headache to rule out the catecholamine producing tumor differentials would be renal uh, could be chronic kidney disease or chronic glomerular nephritis and endocrine type 1 diabetes mellitus with secondary nephropathy leading to hypertension or catecholamine producing tumor uh, so whenever a child comes for, uh, with hypertension uh, with encephalopathy the hypertensive etiology should be ruled out is renal renal vascular cardiovascular malignancies endocrine neurological immunological and any medication histories Which could lead to uh, hypertension with encephalopathy. So you have to uh, look for the clinical uh, signs and examinations uh, to rule out is uh, you have to look for palpitation, sweating, flushing, exophthalmos, tachycardia, any palpable abdominal mass, uh, any fluid overload, any abdominal bruise, any steroid facies, uh, any peripheral pul weak peripheral pulses and low BPs in the lower extremities to rule out uh, cooperation of aorta. And then coming to this child. Uh, There was the child was in hypertensive emergency, so the child was started on nitroglycerin infusion, and thirty percent reduction in the MAP was achieved over the eight hours, and over a period of next forty eight to seventy two hours, anti-hypertensive drugs were optimized, and the BP targets of ninety fifth centile of uh, were achieved. Child's GRPS was three twenty seven milligram per deciliter, and positive urinary ketones of one sixty milligram per deciliter, which is very high positive urinary ketones were present. But there was no high anion gap metabolic acidosis. There was no decay. So for the hypoglycemia, child was started on insulin infusion at point not one unit per kg per hour. Now uh, this acute encephalopathy, GCS of twelve to thirteen, uh, no signs of raised ICP. The fundus examination is normal. Child was maintaining airway and the neuroprotective care was ensured. Coming to investigations, his uh, CVP was showing leukocytosis and thrombocytosis. RFT and LFT is normal uh, with raised tropi and pro BNP with a negative ANA titers, elevated HbA1c, and the normal parathyroid and cortisol levels. We went and did a CT. Uh, it was showing small ill-defined hypersensitive regions in the right capsule uh, ganglionic regions and head of the caudate nucleus and 
corpus callosum genu, likely infarcts. The ECG was suggestive of the left ventricular strain pattern. The 2D echo showed left ventricular hypertrophy, suggestive of chronic hypertension. And we done ultrasound to look the renal causes, uh, which was showing high heterogeneous liquefied focal lesions in bilateral adrenal regions, left more, more than right, likely uh, centrally liquefied adrenal hematomas. So for this funding, we went and did a CT whole abdomen, which was showing bilateral, intensely peripherally enhancing uh, lesions, described possibly few chromocytomas. So this child, uh, during the three days ICU stay and the three days ward stay, child hypertension were optimized and oral with oral antihypertensives and diabetes were controlled as per the sliding scale. Uh, the case was discussed with the surgical and the oncological team and the tumor excision was planned. For an acute hypertension, uh, for this uh, pheochromocytoma during acute crisis and during uh, normal time, you are supposed to do a 24 hour urinary metanexin in catecholamines. So, this case was discussed with endocrinologist who advised to do this test uh, after the crisis settles down. So, the follow up was advised to do a 24 hour urinary metanexin and urinary catecholamines. The child was discharged on these antihypertensives and uh, on insulin, glargine, and ectopid as per the sliding scale. This child was lost to follow up for two months and he was non compliant to the antihypertensive medications. In January, again, child presents to the ER with the complaints of difficulty in walking, right knee pain, and decreased range of movements in the right upper and lower limbs, and headache, and, and so for which child was admitted in the ward. There was no history of cough, fever, vomiting, loss of consciousness, chest pain, blurring of vision, orthostatic hypotension, palpitations, tremor, and other comorbidities. Uh, on systemic examination, there was a diminished motor power of 2 by 5 in the right upper and the lower limb, and the 4 by 5 in the left upper and lower limb. His blood pressures were 144 by 70, and the GRVS was 189. The 24 hour urinary metanephrines and non-metanephrines were very high, and urinary catecholamines of adrenaline and noradrenaline were very high for this child. The repeat 2D echo showed the left ventricular hypertrophy, the rest of the cardiac evaluation was normal. The review ultrasound was done, which was showing a mild hepatomegaly, bilateral adrenal mass lesions with small focal necrotic areas in left more than right, and small hypopoic areas involving the tail of the pancreas. The MRI brain done now showed an early subacute infarct in the left anterior cerebral artery territory. So hypertension, for, hypertension was controlled and 19th percentile BPs were achieved. Uh, parents were counseled for the multidisciplinary team and emphasis was made on the importance of tumor excision, for which family consented, consented. And a multidisciplinary meeting was held involving the pediatric surgeon, pediatric nephrologist, and pediatric endocrinologist, anesthetist, PSU intensivist, hematoncologist, oncologist and child was planned for a bilateral adrenal removal. The pre-op PET scan was done to rule out the meds. So here the PET scan is showing a bilateral pheochromocytoma and there were no signs of meds. There is no evidence of meds. Uh, so coming to the surgical part, I would like uh, Dr. Suramiya to, to give an emphasis on that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will be discussing the surgical findings on behalf of our surgical team at Rainbow. So uh, pre-op uh, preparation, as has already been mentioned by Dr. Aisha, there was a good pressure, blood pressure control was achieved over a period of two days with the medications that have been mentioned over here and good alpha blockade was given. And we decided on a bilateral open adrenalectomy. Uh, during the intraoperative period, at the start of the procedure and with the tissue handling, there was uh, wide fluctuations in the BP for which, uh, uh, which was controlled with a nitroprusside and esmolol infusion. Also, one another important part was after the removal of both the tumors, a significant drop in BP was there, at which time inotropic infusion was needed. So during the surgery, a rooftop incision was given. As we can see over here, this is the right-sided tumor initially, which is very much at the depth, a large tumor uh, around uh, 7 into 4 centimeter. And it is seen to abut the IVC medially, right kidney inferiorly, and liver and gallbladder superiorly. On the left side, uh, the tumor was 12 into 6 centimeter, and it was uh, much adherent to the left kidney, left renal hy hilum, and superiorly to the pancreas and the splenic artery. So it had to be dissected carefully from the surrounding structures. It was uh, We were able to remove it with an intact capsule, and post-removal, uh, normal flow in the blood vessels was confirmed. Uh, 
So this is the left-sided tumor, wherein uh, the first picture shows that uh, it is uh, just sitting on the left kidney with uh, dense additions to the left renal artery as well. And uh, the left adrenal vein in this has been slooped. And uh, following this, it was ligated and cut. So th this is the specimen with uh, the right-sided tumor, uh, a slightly smaller tumor compared to the left side, both having been removed with intact capsules. So now we go over to the post-operative PICU course will be discussed by Dr. Aisha. So uh, post, uh, post op child was shifted to the PSU. Uh, there was refractory hypotension uh, post excision of the tumor for which child was requiring high visopressin and inotropic support. Uh, that was a visopressin at the rate of 0.06 international uh, high, uh, units per kg per minute and adrenaline at one mic per kg per minute and norid at, uh, norid at one mic per kg per minute with a visotropic inotropic score of 800. Valium resuscitation uh, was done as per the invasive hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, the CBPs and the blood pressures and were monitored. And as per that, volume resuscitation was done. The sugars were utilized. He we was started on hydrocortisone infusion. After the endocrinologist opinion, the child was started at, on 125 milligram per meter square. And then gradually, it was tapered to 100, uh, followed by 75 to 50. And stepwise, it was tapered to baseline maintenance. Uh, so at six hours post-op, vasopressin was tapered to 0.02 uh, IU, IU per kg per minute and adrenaline not adrenaline at 0.9 max per kg per minute uh, with the VIS of 390. By 24 hours of vasopressin was at 0.05 uh, international units per kg per minute and 0.5 of adrenaline and not adrenaline with the VIS of 100. And by 48 hours, only norad was there at 0.1 max per kg per minute with the VIS of 10. And by day three, he was off inotropes and vasopressors completely. Come to the ventilation part, child was continued with mechanical ventilation on PRVC mode with the settings of P5, total volume of 300 with an FIO2 of 45, with respiratory rate of 30. Ventilator settings were optimized and uh, child was extubated on post of day three. Oxygen support was gradually tapered and stopped and uh, he was maintaining saturations in room air by day two of post op Infection, uh, child was having persistent high fever spikes for the first 48 hours post-operatively. So he was initially uh, upgraded on antibiotics and we de-escalated the antibiotics as needed and fever spikes settled. Uh, coming to the electrolytes, he in view of the hyponatremia on day four, child was supplemented with 3% uh, NACL and as oral, feeds, uh, oral feeds were restarted, uh, he was started on oral hydrocortisone and extra salt in diet to maintain the sodium levels. The invasive hemodynamic uh, monitoring was done, serial AVGs, chest x rays were done, and the uh, post op 2D occur was suggestive of mild LVH. Post op day three, child was, child was having hypertension for which uh, he was certain on antihypertensives, which were optimized. And uh, post extubation, child had motor aphasia and uh, he had a persistent right human facial weakness, right hemiparesis with the power of 2 by 5 in the right upper and the lower limb with the motor aphasia. Blood pressures were controlled between 90th to 95th centile and he improved uh, with the management and was discharged on antihypertensives and fluorocortisone and 3% NSCM in diet. So the post-op post uh, complications which to be looked out uh, majorly after pheochromocytoma excision is hypotension, arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, heart failure, uh, cerebral uh, adenocortical insufficiency and others uh, renal failure, hypoglycemia, and intestinal uh, pseudo obstruction should also be to looked after. Coming to the learning, coming to the learning points, so pheochromocytoma is a rare uh, or rare neuroendocrine tumors of 0.5 to 2% of the pediatric hypertension. So in contrast to adults, children uh, have hypertension, of, uh, they have sustained hypertension rather than a proximal attacks. And during these hypertensive attacks, headache, palpitations, abdominal pain, dizziness, pallor, vomitings, sweating, seizures, and hypertensive encephalopathy may occur. Uh, the measurements of the plasma in 24-hour urinary catecholamine is recommended, and a urinary VMA has fallen out due to the low sensitivity and specificity. The surgical dissection is the mainstay. And good preoperative hypertension management is important to prevent the intraoperative crisis. And so good alpha blockade decreases uh, the preoperative complication from 50% to 3%. And adrenocortical sparing approach are considered nowadays. 
So intraoperative hypertensive crisis is managed with esmolol and sodium nitroprusside and magnesium sulfate. And post-operative hypertension could be due to the chronic circulating low plasma volume, abrupt decrease in the catecholamines, down regulation of the adrenoreceptors and cardiac dysfunction. So this should be managed judiciously with the fluids, vasopressors, and invasive hemodynamic monitoring. So in pediatrics, 80 persons are inherited. So risk of recurrence is present. So need of genetic evaluation to rule out men and uh, VHL is there. And multidisciplinary approach is needed for a safe uh, pre-op, intra-op, and a post-operative course. So this is the child post-op. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aisha and uh, the entire surgical team of multidisciplinary uh, team of Rainbow for a great and interesting case. Next, we'll have a child with uh, uh, fever, joint pains, and weight loss from Nilofar Hospital. Uh, Dr. Kunal will be present with the case, and uh, Dr. Preeti uh, Nagaraj will be the moderator. Dr. Please come on. Please don't read the sites that we can read in the present case. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Kunal. Uh, today's uh, uh, clinical case is from Nilofar Hospital under the guidance of Dr. Preeti, Professor of Pediatric Nilofar Hospital. Uh, Nine years old female child, resident of Varangal, was brought by mother, a reliable informant with chief complaint of pain in joints since three months, loss of weight since three months, fever since one month, oral ulcers since 10 days, and chest pain since five days. Child was apparently asymptomatic three months before, later developed joint pain since three months, incidence in onset, progressive nature. Initially, there was no restriction of movements, which later progressed, progressed to difficulty in doing daily activities. Initially, started over bilateral elbow joints. Progress to wrist joints, uh, knee, uh, no, followed by knee, uh, metacarbophalangeal joint, followed by knee and ankle joint. Associated with early morning stiffness, decreased on taking pain medications. Uh, there was history of apparent swelling in the uh, uh, bilateral ankle joint one and a half month, one and a half month ago, subsided 20 days back. Complaint of significant weight loss since three months. Uh, the child has lost 4 kgs in the last three months, associated with loss of appetite. Uh, fever since three months, high grade, intermittent, not associated with chills and rigors, relieved on medication, no evening rise of temperature, not associated with rash. Complain of ulcer over the tongue since 10 days, multiple over the lateral margin of the tongue, non painful, not associated with pus discharge or bleeding, not associated with bad breath, dry mouth, difficulty swallowing, not associated with ulcers elsewhere. Chest pain since five days, which was gradually in onset, progressive, present over the anterior aspect of the chest over the left side. Uh, picking type of pain as told by the uh, uh, patient, Inter uh, intermittent pain with no radiation, increase on inspiration and cough. History of cough for a period of 20 days, gradual onset pro non progressive, non productive cough, no diur diurinal variation or postural variation. History of shortness of breath for a period of 20 days, which is gradually onset progressive. Initially, there were, it was a grade 2 uh, dyspnea, later progressed to grade 3, no postural variation, no nocturnal awakening. For this, the child was admitted in MGM uh, Varangal Hospital and treated accordingly. No history of palpitations, edema, no history of headache or dizziness, no history of sore throat, skin, skin lesions, no history of abdominal pain, abdominal distension, vomiting, loose tools, yellowish discoloration of eye, no history of decreased urine output or reduced discoloration of urine, no history of behavioral changes, involuntary movement, seizures or weakness of limb, no, no history of epistaxis or bleeding manifestation, no history of peeling of skin, photosensitivity, no history of drug intake, animal contact. Past history, child was admitted for 21 days with the above complaints at MGM Varangal Hospital and was referred from there for further evaluation in view of 
bronchoscopy. Uh, child had, had a history of surgery at seven and a half years of age in view of uh, duodenal obstruction with a duodenal web at D2 and D3 level for which uh, exploratory laboratory plus duodenostomy with partial excision of the web with closure of the duodenostomy was done. Later, again at eight years of age, child had one more uh, uh, one more surgery in view of midgut malrotation mal and intestinal obstruction. No history of similar complaints in the past. No history of TB or COVID contact. No history of drug, drug intake in the past. Uh, birth history, uh, uh, insignificant. Developmentally normal child studying third class with good scholastic performance. Nutritional history, uh, a deficit of 750 kilocalories and 5 grams of protein was noted. Uh, child was immunized till date as per the National Immunization Schedule. This is that was pregnant. Personal history, uh, ch uh, child had mixed diet, no ball and ball disturbances, no sleep disturbance. Family history, no history of similar complaints in the family. Born to a non conservative marriage, first in birth order. Socioeconomic history belongs to lower middle class according to modified Pukaswami classification. So, history wise summary, nine years old female child, first in birth order, born out of non conservative marriage. A resident of Barangal was brought by a reliable informant with complaint of joint pain and loss of weight since three months, fear since one month, oral ulcers since uh, 10 days, chest pain since five days, with history of cough and shortness of breath for a period of 20 days. With past history of surgery, two surgeries, with past history of two surgeries. On examination, at the time of admission, child was conscious, coherent, sick looking, thin built, and malnourished. Pallor was present, no uh, sinuses, clubbing, colonic, any more significant lymphadenopathy. Head to toe examination, uh, hair appears to be normal. Uh, their frontal alopecia was seen. Oral cavity, multiple oral ulcers present over the lateral border of the thumb. Approximately 0 0.5 to 0.5 centimeters, non-bleeding, non non-oozing ulcers uh, were pale red. No ulcers on the buccal mucosa or the heart parrot. No chelitis, glossitis, or dental caries. No sense of vitamin deficiencies, no direct and neck pains. Uh, other head to toe examination was not. Uh, this is a picture of ulcer present over the lateral part of the tongue. Vitals, uh, temperature was 99 Fahrenheit. Pulse rate was 126, was tachycardic, regular, regular rhythm, normal in volume, no radial, radial or radio femoral delay. Condition of the vessel wall was normal and all peripheral pulses were filled. Respiratory rate was tachypneic, 34 per minute, regular thoracoid per minute. Blood pressure of 95 by 60, uh, between 50th and 50th percentile, recorded in right upper arm in supine position. Uh, SPO2 of 97% on room air with the JVP raised 9 centimeters. Anthropometry weight was less than third centile, height was between third to tenth centile, BMI was less than third centile, with the arm span of 122, which was normal, and SMR staging of stage two. Uh, so, with the history, uh, the main history uh, with what the child was brought to us was uh, joint pain. So, we would like to examine first muscular, musculoskeletal system. Uh, on inspection, gait was normal, posture and balance was normal, no spinal asymmetry. Uh, no limb length discrepancy, no muscle atro atrophy, no prominence of tendons, and no skin lesion. Uh, examination of the joint on inspection, there was no joint, uh, no joint swelling no, uh, noted, no redness. Skin over the joint was normal, no scar sinuses, vis uh, visible discharge around the joint, and no bony deformities. Focus joint examination uh, for knee, ankle, and elbow joint, there was passive and active restriction of movement were present, and joint tenderness was present, but as for no joint swelling. When the child was uh, when the child presented to us, there was no joint swelling. Wrist joint, shoulder, hip joint, and other small joints were normal. Next, cardiovascular system examination inspection. Uh, positive findings are GVP was elevated. Uh, apical impulse seen in 15th the coastal space, lateral to mid line. On palpation, all the inspected findings were confirmed. Apex V2 was felt in the 15th the coastal space, one centimeter lateral to the mid line. No other pulsations were seen. No palpable thrill or parasternal heave was present. On auscultation, S1, S2 was heard. No murmurs heard. S3 gallop was present. Respiratory system examination, positive findings. Uh, vocal phrymitis was present in the right, uh, left infrascapular infra and infraaxillary region. Uh, on percussion, there was dull note in infrascapular and infraaxillary region. On auscultation, there were no additional sounds. Uh, normal vesicular breath sounds heard all over the area except for infra-axillary infra and infra-scapular region, where there was decrease air entry. GI system and CNS system, so, uh, system examination was normal. Summary, a nine-year-old female child was brought by mother with complaint of joint pains and loss of weight since three months, fever since one month, oral ulcers since 10 days, chest pain since five days, 
with the history of confirmed shortness of breath for a period of 20 days for which the child was admitted in Barangal, Barangal Hospital with a past history of two surgeries. On examination, child is thin built, pallor present, ulcer over the tongue present, alopecia present, child is tachycardic, tachypneic, elevated GVP, increased precordial activity, the esprit gallop, with a decreased air entry in left infrascapular and infraaxillary region, and increased vocal chromatis and resonance in the same region. During the course of hospital at MGM Hospital, in view of fear, shortness of breath, and curves, the child uh, with the clinical and the radiological uh, findings, child was started on IV antibiotic for which, uh, uh, with the uh, like, uh, which were upgraded to VACO and Mirogonum uh, in view of uh, no, no response to the previous antibiotics. In view of uh, CCF, child was uh, started on uh, Lobotamine and Lasix. <laughs> So actually, there was a new finding at Nilofar Hospital, sir. Yeah. So, so I was telling, let the people discuss. This is the history. This is the yeah. history. When you come to the summary and you go back to history, then now you open for discussion. Let people discuss. Yes, what is the possible difference in diagnosis here? What could be considered as possibility? Infected, non-infected? That uh, that has appeared after uh, getting admitted into the Nilo Hospital on day five of admission. Child has erythematous rash over the face uh, on the nasal bridge and in the malar region with uh, uh, similar rash present on the forearm and the palms also. Any eye symptoms? No. No pain. No blurry. No. His voice is so good, he's acting like a sleeping kid. Yeah, I think uh, how many of the postgraduates here? I am genuine. Don't ask questions, then everybody will raise. No, no. <laughs> how many of the postgraduates all sitting in the back only? Okay, one, only five, six, seven. So, what he said was this is a chronic history. Three months history, correct? And uh, first two months are only arthralgia, and there is some history of arthritis. So, difference between arthralgia and arthritis is what? Pain versus swelling. But there is some history of arthritis in the history, but on the examination, it's only arthralgia. The big joint pains. And joint pains are either migratory or the static? static? Static. Normally, if migratory has a clinical clue, that you don't, don't have any differential. Migratory arthritis is proven to be rheumatic, rheumatic fever. Okay, so it is non-migratory, and it is arthralgia. No, no, it affects all the four joints and remain like that. In fact, it develops the. So actually, the joints involvement was in this fashion, sir. But uh, it was not like migratory. All four, uh, all the joints were involved, and the previous joints were not. Uh, so in migratory, the pleating, one joint involved that recovers, other comes that recovers. So it is like this is progressive type, one by one joint. So there is arthralgia, and is it local or systemic? There's a lot of history to tell us that it is a systemic disease. So this baby has, or this child has systemic disease, which is involving the joints, and which other system it's involving? Which other system from the history? Respiratory system. And he was giving a very clear history of the respiratory system. He was saying that the child has pain while coughing, while deep breathing. What does it mean? It is a pleuritis, pleurocytis, pleuritis. And that was confirmed on your examination also. So this child has systemic disease, which causes arthralgia, which causes pleuritis. And one very important clinical clue was there in the history. What was that? No. That, that is actually a diagnostic clue. Oral ulcer. So what is the characteristic of oral ulcer? This oral ulcer has a very characteristic feature. And if it's, that is there, you make the diagnosis. What is the characteristic feature of oral ulcer in this type? Is it after ulcer? It is not after. If it is after ulcer, we will not consider this part of the syndrome. But this is not after ulcer. These ulcers are normally seen on the buccal cavity. 
not on the tongue. If you look at the sides, you will see the ulcers. They are sometimes reticulated pattern and they are painless. That is a characteristic feature. Painless mouth ulcers with arthralgia, systemic disease or fever lasting for one month. You don't have a differential. Even before the rash, you could have made the diagnosis of SLE. There is nothing else. Painless mouth ulcers, arthralgia, chronic illness, weight loss, girl child, pleuritis. I don't think we have any differential. And when he comes to the Nilofar hospital, you got the diagnosis. And he was telling you that rash is typically on the nose, on the malar face. But going back itself, the clue was there in the mouth. Okay. Now, fortunate for the child that the child has taken three, three months. Many of them, they deteriorate much faster. So this baby, or this child also has one more heart, heart involvement. There is a gallop. So gallop means cardiac muscle involved. He said there is no murmur. That means there is no TR, there is no MR. If TR, MR was there, endocardial involvement is there. If it is a muscle involved, you will get, you will get the gallop. So there is gallop, cardiac involvement, cirrhositis, lung involvement, arthralgia, chronic fever presenting as of of unknown origin, and you have a mouth ulcer, which was almost confirmatory of SLE. Now, which other disease we should have thought of? If the, with the same etiology. Can it be tuberculosis? Can it be tuberculosis? Yes, it can be tuberculosis, but the presentation would be like slightly different. The child will present predominantly with respiratory symptoms, fever, and then develops arthralgia. Arthralgia coming as the presenting symptom is little late in tuberculosis. They could also have fever, chronic fever, chronic arthralgia, weight loss, cough, but there in tuberculosis, mostly it will be like lung involvement. So they'll have productive sputum. By six months or six years also, they could have productive sputum. So this tells that it's more of a pleurisy. And usually, if it is a pleural tuberculosis, they will have predominantly only pleural effusion. Weight loss, fever, pleural effusion. They will not have much of the lung involvement. If there is a predominant alveolar involvement, you will see fever, cough, and pneumonia, like picture, will see multi organ dysfunction. Actually, in because pleurisy is a sign of good immunity, it will get localized to pleural cavity. But here, there is pleurisy with multi system involvement. So, tuberculosis was less than for if it's a girl, boy, child, what will be thought of? Girl is leading her to diagnose of SLE, but similar presentation in a boy, except for the mouth ulcer, what will you think of? He has told you that, yeah. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis are more common than JRA. Juvenile, Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Now, what are the characteristic clues for JRAs? Are there any clinical clues for JRAs? What are the clinical clues? Exactly like this PUO, fever, weight loss, arthralgia will be there, joint pains could be there, but no. they are disseminated rash all over the body. Rash will be very prominent during the fever. So it will be like evanescent rash. When the child is well, no fever, no rash. But when the child has fever, there will be a significant rash. And that will be a very characteristic feature of their. So what are the system we should have asked? Because we are talking about so tuberculosis is out. They are is if it is a male child. And SLE is definitely on card. What else? Which other rheumatological disease presents with ulcers, mouth ulcers? Biceps. Biceps. So, but biceps also have genital involvement and less likely in this age group. Eye examination, eye examination is normal, but age group also not very sure. Does it fit into age group now? That's very unlikely it fits into this age group. Slightly adolescents or slightly elder children or elder adults. Yeah. And one more possibility we thought was it can be I think that, that diagnosis cannot be missed on. But clinical clues for HIV would be hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, generalized lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and in this child, if they are there, that will lead to the clinical, uh, that will lead to the diagnosis of HIV. Okay. Can it be a lymphoma? NHL. Can it be an NHL? 
So NHL may not have generalized the presence. So yeah, those are odd features, but you could have lymphoma presenting like only there could be only masses in the chest. Child is losing weight. Child is having chronic fever. But arthralgia is little odd, but they will present more with PUO and sometimes there could be only nodes in the retroperitoneum or in the chest. So lymphomas can have masquerade all these illnesses. But three to four months. Uh, the arthritis in such a well as child was not able to do her daily activities also. By the time she had come to us, she was okay. So maybe some analysis six months. Yeah, so analysis was working for that, but then another possibility can be a leukemia also can be a possibility. So leukemia also could be possible, but again, there you'll have hepatosplenomegaly, yeah. lymphadenopathy, yeah. and anemia, thrombocytopenia people could be there. If we think of leukemias and lymphomas, lymphomas can present because whether it is initial or it is a um, so they both can have presentation, but more likely initial will have more of systemic features rather than Hodgkin. So the clinical clues in this child are the ulcers, and was it painless or painless? Painless. painless. We should look for the buccal cavity. You will see a lot of these ulcers. We should have it done. And he showed us the time, but I am sure they are Buckle cavity ka bhi hai? So, whenever any other child comes to you next time, fever, arthralgia, look for rash, evanescent rash, fever related rash, think of ARA. If ulcers in the mouth, painless ulcers in the mouth, think of HIV. And another important history could have been photosensitivity. Was there any history of photosensitivity? No history of photosensitivity, but if history of photosensitivity, it will also yes. ask. Yes. So, does it fill into the SLE criteria or not? It does. So, what clinically, what? almost three organs are classically involved yes. joint, cirrhositis, heart, and the which other? Skin also involved. Yes. So, mucosal and skin alone. So, it involves three or more organs lasting for more than this, this history is lasting for more than four weeks. So, how will we confirm the diagnosis? Uh, what is your differential diagnosis? It's the same differential, sir. Okay. Same word, sir. <laughs> what, what, sir? We entertain the diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever and uh, juvenile hepatic arthritis, SLE, HIV associated. So, diagnosis? Sir, always infective causes should be ruled out first, sir. So, we kept as in charge. seeing the butterfly diagnosis. Sir, rash was, rash appeared on the fifth day of admission, sir. So, we have seen, uh, like, on the first day, a rash was not our main concern. Like the other features, arthritis was the main concern for us. Sir. Arthritis and cardiac involvement. So two major criteria were fitting, sir. This child, when she has come, the mother's concern was the child was rest of the mother hospital for pneumonia consolidation. Mother was not bothered about that also. She was bothered that the child is losing weight and child fever is not coming down. Significant weight loss for the other fear and fever was my concern. She was saying. So then we thought maybe this is not a pneumonia or persistent pneumonia or COVID pneumonia or something. And we got all the tests. They were referred for bron bronchoscopy actually. They wanted the bar to be done. Then we thought, hey, we have to work it in some other way. And then show that, as you said, the, the only thing was they had to investigate only for the SLE and all tests you can tell all came uh, positive. No, I, I Why the patient was taken for bronchoscopy? We didn't say. We did not it was referred. It was referred because the child's pneumonia consolidation is not taken care of. Child had a persistent fever for past one month. Got animated and given a higher antibiotic of Banco Nero the past 20 days. And the cough persisted. And weight loss was significant. Mother and they were referred to refer for the bronchoscopy. Maybe there is some uh, foreign body or they were suspecting the thing, which we did not. No, no, even before the rash, I think the diagnosis should no, have been made. Uh, well, we everything was telling that it was. And now what are the other clues you'll get from the investigation before he goes for investigation? What are you expecting? Going to the IT investigations, you can tell what investigations, what investigations they are expecting. 
Why have I thought of brood cell as the second one? In this case, madam, the negative points are first is oral ulcers are not caused. We don't find oral ulcers in the brood cell. What we find in brood cell is the most important matter fever, weight loss, low grade fever, joint pain without any cleaning or fight. All of that in the history of all we concern. Goat milk injection, consumption is important. मिल्क On investigation, uh, investigating, there was a, a lymphopenia with uh, thrombocytopenia with reticulum count of one point five percent and normal sinus normal chronic blood picture. ESR was elevated, CRP was elevated, ESR was eighty six first hour, CRP was eight. Uh, uh, TB workup was negative. HIV was negative. Uh, ASO titers were less than 200. DCT was negative. Direct home stress was negative. Uh, serum C3 complement levels were reduced. Uh, this is a chest X-ray. This was the first X-ray at the time of admission. Uh, there was uh, there is cardiomegaly with the upturned uh, apex. One. This is the left lateral uh, X-ray of the child uh, showing. Uh, heterogeneous opacities in the uh, lower segment, lower uh, uh, lower lower lobes, no? Up, uh, su superior basal segment of the lower lobes. HRCT was done. It showed wedge wedge shaped opacities with air bronchogram noted in left lower lobe, suggestive of lobar consolidation. Basal lateral excesses noted in right lower lobe. But aromatoid factor was positive. A uh, anti DS DNA was positive. ANA was positive. ANA immunofluorescence showed four plus with a dilution of one in one in hundred. Anti cardiolipin IgM was positive. Anti Jo positive. Anti Rho also positive. Today, uh, dilated LV, uh, at the time of admission, dilated LV LV mild LVH with good bilateral function. Uh, uh, like repeat today, ko showed uh, it was done after twenty uh, days. Uh, after the uh, after starting the treatment, it, it was little bit mild LR was a dilated LA will be a bit mild LR with uh, good bioventricular function. Uh, actually, according to the new ULR criteria, 2019 ACR criteria, uh, seven uh, eight clinical dom seven clinical domains with the three eight clinical domains with three uh, immunological domains are there. A total of more than ten uh, of, from the score of 51. Like from each domain, the maximum count should be taken. And a total of a total score of fifty one, more than ten, it should be positive. So for this child, a total score of twenty seven was positive. So we have kept a diagnosis of juvenile SLE with lupus pneumonitis, uh, with residual carditis. And uh, references uh, like uh, uh, actually uh, uh, this was not an infect. The consolidation was not an infective origin, and more likely because of the uh, SLE. Uh, the prevalence of uh, parenchymal involvement in SLE for acute lupus pneumonitis is eight, one to eight percent. Respiratory involvement prevalences are uh, there in this picture, and there are some articles which shows that uh, uh, respiratory involvement actually uh, lupus pneumonitis clinically and radiologically uh, mimics very similar to acute infectious pneumonias. So that was. This was the approach to our CRP ESR ratio is very interesting. CRP is near normal. ESR was positive. This is a true for this. Thank you. Thank you, Rilo, for a nice case. Danavel. Danavel to present the case of newborn with the respiratory disease. And Murki will be guiding him. Sorry, from Paradise Hospital.
good afternoon everyone uh, we are presenting a case with term unit with an rd and we are having a baby uh, who was born to an autotic congenital couple uh, early term gestation uh, delivered by two lcs in our previous lcs and oligo hydromas and the baby was a female child female baby with birth weight of 2.14 kg uh, with an uh, corresponding to uh, iug status and the baby carried immediately after birth and that day on that six hour and with poor, as the baby was having poor efforts immediately after birth baby was intubated and was treated uh, with the mechanical ventilator support and at six hours of life baby had a seizure activity in the with an unknown semiology and for that baby was treated with uh, gardena and uh, at the same time baby had a severe shock uh, with severe metabolic acidosis with abg uh, in respect to manner of ph pco2 po2 uh, bicarbonate and base excess in order of 7.04.8455 and -20 respectively and for the same reason baby was treated with the fluid fluids crystallized colloids and the bicarbonate correction was also given and baby was extubated to hfnc at 15 hours of life immediately after extubation baby had a worsening of rt requiring high fio2s and high flows and hfnc and for that baby was intubated and transported to our hospital and when you come to anti and these are presenting complaints and when you go back to the history and mother was a mother had a regular anti rectal checkups and the anom scans were normal and the mother was spontaneously conceived and uh, uh, the mother had an unexplained oligohydramnus at 30 weeks and was known hypothyroid and on medication and uh, they, they uh, had a previous sibling death and day one of life and the baby was termed gestation and death was uh, documented as MSL and RT. And there was no history of maternal fever, prolonged rupture of membranes, prolonged labor, decreased fetal movements and CTG was not done. And there was no MSL and baby was delivered by elective LCS. And there was uh, family history was not such, uh, there were no sudden deaths in the family members as well as no history of seizure disorders. An examination, baby had a floppiness uh, with pitted fog position, sensorium was rosy, and spontaneous eye opening was present. And the uh, examination wise, baby had a wide and open AF, short neck, depression as well as low set ears, redundant uh, skin folds on the back of the neck. The neuroequitinous markers are not seen. And the vitals are uh, heart rate is 146 per minute and BP 64 by 32 mm of HG in the right upper loop and right upper limb and with a map of 42 mm of HG. And baby was on SAMB with a pressure support of 16 by 5, FAO2 requirement 30%, rate of 40, with SPO2 greater than 95%. And respondents' respiratory efforts are also present. And anthropometric measurements, uh, assessed gestational age was 37 weeks with weight corresponding to 2.14 kg, corresponds to third center, and length 43 centimeters, corresponds to third center, head circumference 33 centimeters, corresponds to 52nd center. And baby had a edema on the back of the neck with no bladder, cyanosis, pedo edema, and lymphadenopathy. But edema on the back of the neck was present. And a systemic examination, cardiovascular with normal S1, S2, no murmur, and all peripheral pulses were felt. And bilateral area entry were present and no clips were present in the respiratory system. And per abdomen wise, it was soft, distended, and hepatomegaly with liver, poor segments below right coastal margin and form with consistency. And the spine was normal. And uh, sensor, baby sensor was rosy with intermittent spontaneous opening and decreased state to state variability. Good fa facial grammacing was there, and the tone was decreased both in axial and appendicular skeleton. <coughs> Decreased in axial and appendicular skeleton and occasional and limited anti gravity movements with power grade corresponding to 2 to 3 by 5 was present. And ETR was not elicited and no fasciculations in the tongue were noted. And AF is wide and open and the spine is normal. And uh, while examining, and these are the uh, photos of the while examining the baby for eliciting the DTR, but we didn't get it. What are the differential diagnoses from history as well as the examination? Summary. Sorry, sorry. Uh, we are having a uh, baby with who was a term gestation, 2.14 kg, female child, IGR, uh, algo with algo hydromnus, previous uh, sibling death at uh, day one of life, intubated for poor respiratory efforts, early shock with metabolic disease, neutral seizures, and floppiness. What's the possible uh, 
So if you get a baby like that, who is term IUGR has seizures and then remains floppy and poor respiratory effort. So what is the first thing? Why you want to cancel IU? More common than IU. You already have a term IUGR, oligohydramma. Baby had requirement respiratory efforts at birth. And having seizures within six hours. So, why do you want to consider IEM in this? What is more common than IEM? Every day you would see this case. HIE. Yeah. So, the first possibility is HIE. Okay. So, why it is, what are the things favoring HIE? What are the things against HIE in this test? So what is against HIE? Is there anything against HIE? IUGR. In fact, IUGR will be favoring HIE because chronic in your track of the delivery, but it's leading to secondary acid. So it is. So one important history is the previous sibling death, but he said it is because of meconium chain language. It is not tough. He didn't tell you the details, but he told you that it's MSF. Because what a Selective section. Yeah. So, what is the diagnosis which comes to your mind when you have a baby like that? Baby is floppy, sensorium is depressed, and has seizures from six hours. So, what is the classical history of an IEM? What is the classical history of an IEM? Yeah, they are normal at birth. So, they are normal at birth, they are exclusively breastfed. On the second and third day. So usually IEM is something which will affect all the pediatricians. Because you declare baby is alright, second, third day, baby will have a lot of seizures, encephalopathy, and baby will die. So that's a rapid progression will be there. Second day presentation, first day, well, baby, cried well, no asphyxia, breastfed baby, second, third day, baby deteriorate dramatically, then you should think of IEM. So there is no history of IEM in this child. Except that confinality history or maybe the previous sibling death, but IEM project is like this little odd. But there are some IEMs which can present like this. One of them is engaged, non ketotic hypertension. They are present with seizures right from birth. Okay, but rare. What else? So asphyxia is one possibility. Can asphyxia have generalized hypotonia? Yes. yes. Severe asphyxia can have generalized hypotonia, but in the aspects of it generalizes, it's a brain stem problem or a deep brain that is basal ganglia and thalamus are affected. That means it's a severe acute asphyxia will cause brain stem problem. There they will have respiratory symptoms, like what you saw here. But they can be also pupillary symptoms. So he didn't tell us, but one needs to look at us when pupils are dilated or not, pooling of secretion is there or not. But he's saying eye movements are all right. Intermittently, baby is opening the eye and there is no pooling of secretion. If there is a bulbar palsy like this, then you can think of acute asphyxia as a cause. But odd features are you don't have bulbar like symptom, bulbar palsy like symptom, and you don't have eye finding. Okay, these are little odd, but still it can fit into that. What else? Any other PG? Six hour seizures. Baby is not well at birth, present with seizures in six hours, and it comes to the emergency. Very good. So it can be simple hypoglycemia. There is asphyxia and hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia can present with six hour seizures. It can have hypotonia. It can have dullness, weakness. All that can be explained. Yeah. So severe hypoglycemia could be one differential for this case. What else? Anything happens to the delivery to the brain? Any problems happen during delivery? Intracranial hemorrhage. Very good. So if the one of the things that birth is birth or birth related. Birth is asphyxia. Birth related could be intracranial hemorrhage. It could be intraventricular, intraparenchymal, subarachnoid, extradural hemorrhages. So these acute hemorrhages then can present as seizures in the first few days and they can have sudden onset pallor. But he didn't tell us anything about sudden onset pallor. And these things are more common if there is an operative delivery, like a vacuum, forceps extraction. Forceps is done in C section. Very rarely. So they use forces also to take the head out sometimes. Okay. So acute 
Acute hemorrhage can be one of the cause for this. Acute problem, especially when you have hypotonic bleeding. But he didn't tell anything about pallor. If it was causing such encephalopathy, there will be definitely severe pallor in this child. Okay, what else? So hemorrhage, asphyxia, low on the card, one some type of IEM, hypoglycemic. Okay. Infection, can it be a bad infection? Early onset sepsis, in utero choreomonitis, and baby having meningitis and seizures. Very rare, but very, very low on the card because there is no history of fever, rash, constant type prolonged rupture of membranes, UTI, mother and antibody. Nothing is there. If nothing is there, why will the baby land up with infection on the first few hours? Okay. So infection is almost very, very low on the card. Okay. So we are now having possibility of only asphyxia as the main thing and probably hypoglycemia. The entry to the perineal lymphoid can be done. Okay, so we'll go back and see whether evaluation of asphyxia does it lead us to any clues. Baby was continued on mechanical ventilation for poor efforts, and baby on and we have shock with hepatomegaly and severe metabolic disease on admission with pH of seven point one, CCO two thirty two, base excess minus sixteen, and high high anion gap metabolic disorders. For the baby was treated with crystallites, inotropes, dope, and dobita. And uh, as it is a refractory shock, short push shade was given, and no, there were no seizures since admitted. And the baby was treated with a maintenance dose of cardinal, phenobarbital. An initial evaluation we did with the routine uh, complete blood picture uh, of HIV showing 15.3, WBC 9.6 of 300, 2.2 lakh, CRP 1.2 milligram per liter, uh, uh, GRB 85 milligram per deciliter, and MARS workup was done. Which was showing the RFT uh, 28 as bilirubin 13.7 electrolytes in the order of uh, sodium, potassium, and chloride of 1.1, 4.8, and 1.06 respectively. Serum calcium 9.5, PDNR 20, uh, 1.8, sir. And LFT is also of rise at HGVT and HGPT 92 by 158. So, what is now, what is it saying? What do you have in asphyxia? Asphyxia is a multi system injury. Because by the time it causes brain injury, it should cause damage of all other organs. All of you know the diving reflex. Okay, if there is asphyxia, first the body will try to protect the brain. If brain is already damaged, means definitely there should be other organ effects. So that is why MODS, multi-organ dysfunction workup, is must whenever you have a child with encephalopathy in the first three days. Now, is there any MODS in this child? Which organ is most commonly affected apart from brain in asphyxia? Gut, okay. Then we have a kidney, polyuria. So, the, what is he saying about the urea creatine? Urea creatine is normal. So, that means there is not much of kidney injury. So, without kidney injury, to have a severe brain injury, little odd. Then we have to think of something else. But there is another organ injury which is trying to tell us. What is that? Liver. SGOT, SGVT is elevated. But not severe because PTA is normal. It's not gone into liver cell failure, but there is some amount of hypoxic liver injury as suggested by the SGOT SGPT. Okay. So there is some clue that it could be asphyxia, but there are some negative points that it may not be bad asphyxia because your urea creatinine is normal. Okay. And uh, uh, on Mars Marto, we did a uh, neurosonogram with the background issue of seizures, which was showing bilateral ventricular failure and no uh, intracranial hemorrhage as well as intraventricular hemorrhage and no sexual abnormalities. EG has shown. Sorry, sir. And EG has shown mild diffuse encephalopathy. We did chest x ray with the background issue of poor respiratory efforts and requiring high FFO2 initially with severe metabolic acidosis, which is has shown cardiomegaly. Research of mesocardiomegaly and no uh, respiratory norm with, with uh, pneumonia, sereni, uh, serocytis. And in screen 2D echo, uh, we can see there is a biventricular hypertrophy with uh, both uh, left ventricle as well as septum as well as right ventricle hypertrophy with poor ejection fraction and uh, obstructing the left ventricle outlet. So if you see this card, this is right ventricle, this is the left ventricle. So you can see, go back, you can see this entire heart is echogenic and hypertrophic. 
Okay, so this is a severe hypertrophy of the both right and left ventricle with cardiac dysfunction, and that's why there was hepatomegaly. Fever was four centimeter, and he had shock, severe metabolic acidosis. Okay, now you know that more than asphyxia is something else sitting there. Okay, we thought of asphyxia initially, but looking at this echo, we know that okay, we are dealing with something else, and then there are other features which are now telling us that okay, this may not be asphyxia. So what are other features which he had? Term IUGR, oligoadrenals, poor respiratory efforts at birth, and then seizures. Then you have shock, cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and one more thing. What was there on the face? Dysmorphism. Close at ears. There was nape of the neck was showing this, and severe hypotonia. Normally, in asphyxia, you will not see floppiness of all four limbs. Flaccid all four limbs is unlikely in asphyxia. In asphyxia, it's a differential hypotonia. In term asphyxia, differential hypotonia, which will affect predominantly the shoulder muscle, it will spare the lower limbs. So when you look at the upper limb and you can pull the shoulder like this, but when you see for the popular language, you will be a little tight. Okay, so differential hypotonia is classical of asphyxia. Whole body hypotonia is little odd. Now, now we are coming to a diagnosis. So you have a floppy infant. You have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You have you have the uh, shock related to hypertrophy and dysmorphism. Okay, dysmorphism, hypotonia or floppiness, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So with these three combinations, what are your differences? Very good. So first possibility will come to anybody's mind is pompous disease or glycogen storage disorder, one of the types. Anything else? What are other differentials for pompous disease? Diabetes. But there is no. In fact, in fact, diabetic mother is very good. So mitochondrial disorders because mitochondrial disorders will have exactly same thing: floppiness, dysmorphism can be there, cardiomyopathy. Mitochondrial can also have ocular involvement, nystagmus, okay, obsoclonus. So and mitochondrial can be also episodic okay they will have acute illness deteriorate normalize then deteriorate so episodic illness is a feature of mitochondrial disorder what is cardiomyopathy hypotonia or floppiness one more myopathy okay all the myopathies can be considered yes what else one more thing acidosis yes severe acidosis fatty acid oxidation okay so they also have floppiness cardiomyopathy and acidosis so this combination you see in fatty acid oxidation defect mitochondrial disorder pompous or other glycogen storage defect with these three possibilities then we evaluated further that's look what will come out As we discussed, and we did the ECG, which was showing a rate of one zero seven per minute with a normal sinus rhythm, giant voltage complexes in the V five, V six, and short PR interval with the delta wave, such stuff, WP, WC. So you can see some of here. Uh, so when, so these are significant. Uh, um, R waves. V four, V five, V six. You add more than forty five. It was here. When you add V five, V six, it's more than thirty five. Saying that definitely there is cardiac hypertrophy. Now, what was interesting was the delta wave, up slurry. Where was that? This many or this many. So you can see some of this. Yeah, you can see there is some amount of up slurry. So the narrow PR interval. So PR interval is very narrow. In fact, it is merging with the QRS. Okay, you can see it is almost merging with the QRS. So narrow PR PR interval, delta uprising delta wave. This classical feature of W P W. So this baby child also has atopic cardiomyopathy, W P W C. Okay. So on the heart, now once you look at this, you will think it is hundred percent pompous. Okay. So but every atopic cardiomyopathy will have like this. Why it should be only pompous? All hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will have V five V six. The 
total IO will be more than 35, and some of them can have uh, the PR, started PR also. Okay. So, like all of you, we also thought it is 100% competent. Okay. So, then what happened? Then we sent the glycosidase, which came as normal. Okay. And CPK MB level was high, saying that, okay, there is a muscular involvement, but this is not competent. Then what do we do? So, is there any other clue which we have? What are the size of three different cells? Pompeii, fatty acid oxygen effect, and mitochondria. So, for fatty acid, are there any clues? Fatty acid, acidosis. 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 Acidosis is definitely there. So, hypoglycemia is there. 53 sugar is not hypoglycemia for us. Okay. For adults, it may be hypoglycemia, but for newborns, it is not hypoglycemia. So, there is no hypoglycemia. But severe metabolic acidosis is there. But what will tell you that in acidosis, what will tell you that this is fatty acid? Urine ketones. Absent urine ketones. You have acidosis, but fatty acids are not working because there is a block in the pancreas pathway. That is why you are not getting ketones. So, acidosis, absent ketones is almost proven to be a case of fatty acids. If you have hypoglycemia, definitely it is considered. But hypoglycemia is not there. So, next slide. So, acidosis, wide anion gap, urine ketones negative. So, ketones were negative in this set. Again, we thought, okay, we have hit on the diagnosis. But, less sugar was normal. Okay. Serum lactate was 80. Serum lactate 80. Normal lactate is about 10 to 14. Okay. 80 is almost 8 times that of normal. Very high serum lactate level. And, we thought still it is fatty acid, so we sent a EMPS. EMPS said no, this is not fatty acid. Okay, so left over with mitochondria. mitochondria. Okay, high lactate. But normally in mitochondria, lactate is more than 90 millimoles per liter. Okay, so here it is just from the 80, but normally in mitochondria, primary lactic acidosis is more than 90. So we are hoping it will turn out to be mitochondrial disorder. So what do you do? How do you how do you pick up a mitochondrial disorder? What diagnosis? How can you pick up? Huh? Genetics. So only that can pick up, but it will take six weeks. Genetic will take six weeks. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, floppy infant, high anion gap, high lactate. We started on CoQ carnation timing. There was no response even to this. Continued to have persistent shock, metabolic acidosis, and need for ventilation. So we sent for clinical exam sequencing. Explained a very poor prognosis to the parents. They didn't want to continue the treatment, but they wanted evaluation to be done. So the baby succumbed because of refractory shock, secondary to cardiac hypertension. Now, very important in HOCM, it should not give regular inotropes. Dobutamine, dopamine, these should be avoided. You should give more of yes, fluids. So you should be on the slightly on the higher side of fluids. So, fluid should be the crux of management of HOC. If you are not able to control with fluid, should give low dose dopamine up to maybe 5 or 7.5. If still not working, use vasopressin. Okay, and that's what we did here. Dopamine, vasopressin, and steroids. These are the medicines. Never use dobutamine, milrinone. These drugs are not good drugs because they will cause more hypertrophy and they will worsen the shock. Okay, fluid, dopamine. Vasopressin are the crux of management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, so anyway, so that was the case. So, most likely it will turn out to be mitochondrial disorder. But if it turns out to be anything else on the clinical exam, we'll come back to it. But uh, there are so many differentials for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay. So, when you look at all these differences, also we are looking like it is coming out to be only. Mostly yeah, mitochondria. And then uh, again and again, the same is spelling over this thing. Can we spell your name once you come to the mentioned? Maybe turn up or something. So, because that's a spelling was there, and now it's wonderful. So, Nunan's also was kept as one of the differences. So, if you see this syndromic approach for hypertrophic area, Nunan's also is there. Very Nunan's. Nunan's also is there. So, what Madam was saying that if you have nuchal fold thickening, so if it is a if it is a girl, a boy child, you'll think of Nunans. If it is a girl child, you'll think of Turner's. Okay. But one very characteristic features of Nunans which helps you to pick up the diagnosis is 50% of them will have population abnormal. Abnormal PTAP. So 
fifty percent. So if you have problem with the and this feature, it will almost sit in the component. But they will also have other link padding other features. So very interesting. Let's hope what diagnosis will get. Maybe we'll reveal to Dr. Baskar in the next clinical meeting. You can tell them sir, sure. or we can message to everybody. Sure. Thank you. Yes. So today we had a uh, fantastic session, interesting session, which is useful not only for PGs, we practice also learned so many things. Uh, thank you all, especially uh, the Ankara Hospital, which has hosted this uh, clinical meeting, and uh, the uh, moderators, Dr. Namita and Dr. Anshal, and our IHP president, Dr. Bhaskar, and uh, our secretary, uh, uh, Sikh, and our vice president, uh, Central IAP, Dr. Pravit Maharal. And all the participants. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, he needs special mention. <laughs> he made it. I mean, the session uh, uh, alive by uh, triggering the thoughts and. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Anupama probably uh, she she is not here. So all the participants, Dr. Harshita, Dr. Aisha, Dr. Granavel, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Kunal, Dr. Kunal. So, Dr. Paraji, uh, Dr. Preeti, and uh, uh, Dr. Anupama, Dr. Manik. So, thank you all for uh, and uh, yeah, my uh, friend, IAP, uh, senior IAP member, Dr. Arvind, and all the participants for uh, coming forward and uh, attending the session. It's a wonderful session. Look forward for uh, uh, many more interesting sessions. Thank you all. Thank you.